This episode is brought to you by The Jordan Harbinger Show. Do you want a new podcast to look forward to each week? One that's got it all, entertainment, information, and stuffed with actionable content? Yeah, you do. Because who wouldn't want to listen in as Jordan dives into the minds of fascinating people from athletes, authors, and scientists to mobsters and spies? Each week, Jordan uses his interviewing talents to bring you never-before-heard stories and insights to make life more understandable. He has one of the most highly rated self-development shows out there. Listen in, learn, and look forward to each new episode, like I do. And I would like to recommend a few episodes myself. The first one is episode 650, Brian Kloss, The Corruptible Influence of Power. And the other one is episode 585 with Timothy Snyder, 20th Century Lessons on Tyranny. Check them both out. You can't go wrong with adding the Jordan Harbinger show to your rotation. It's incredibly interesting. There's never a dull show. Search for the Jordan Harbinger show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Audible.com. As you are no doubt aware, Audible is the Internet's leading provider of audiobooks. With well over 100,000 titles to choose from, everyone can find something to like, especially when it's free. This time, I would like to recommend two books from my list of Audible resources on my website. The first is The Book Thief by Marcus Zusak. This is not a history book, but you will get a feel of what it's like to live in Germany during the war. And I guarantee you, your commute will disappear if you get this. The characters are amazing, and the reader takes the book to another level. The other book is The Few, The American Knights of the Air, Who Risked Everything to Fight in the Battle of Britain, by Alex Kershaw. This is the story of three Americans who made their way to Britain to fight with the RAF during the summer of 1940. The three men end up in either 609 Squadron or 601 Squadron, so it goes into a lot of detail about those particular squadrons, so it adds nicely to what I've been doing with my broad strokes. It covers all the events, but it also gives you a good idea of what the pilots were doing when they were not in the air. You won't regret it. And you can find this information and a lot of other things at my website at worldwar2podcast.net. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II, Episode 49, The Day of Eagles. With Adler Tog days away, the weather was still being uncooperative with Gehring's plans. Thursday, August 8th, had clouds in the channel and showers over Britain, with a few bright patches. But if the weather could ignore the field marshal, then he would ignore it. He would move forward with beginning phase two of his plan to destroy the RAF. And, without knowing it, the British Admiralty was about to help him. The recent reduction of convoy raids compared to the second week of July convinced those in charge that daytime travel could begin again. But, just to be safe, a convoy of 20 merchantmen and nine naval escorts left the Medway and slipped through the Dover Straits, or Hellfire Corner, during the night of the 7th. But what no one on the British side of the channel knew was that the Germans were now actively using their radar and that the Freya unit at Camp Blanc Nez picked up the ships trying to sneak past. And the British personnel on the ships should have been looking down into the water as the sun came into view on the 8th, not up to the skies. On that early morning, German e-boats, or motorized torpedo boats, eased their way towards the convoy CW-9, but codenamed Peewit by Fighter Command, and attacked. The British escort vessels did their best, but surprise is the best weapon of all. Three steamers were sunk in the engagement. The Aus, which had no casualties, the Home Force, which had six, and the Fife Coast, which had five. Eventually, the E-boats were chased away, or 
were they getting out of the way of the coming German bombers. Around nine that morning, Sperla released von Richthofen, the Red Baron's cousin from the previous war, and told him to destroy that convoy. Here was a real chance to show the British that a negotiated peace was the only way they could survive and have enough to feed themselves. Two successive raids, totaling 57 Stukas, 20 ME-110s, and 30 ME-109s, attacked the beleaguered convoy. Meanwhile, the British knew that a mistake had been made in regards to the convoy, but there was nothing for it now. So three sections escorted the ships and were soon joined by two more squadrons. But the German planes came on anyway. Simply, these were numbers that the British had not had to deal with yet, but they stayed in tight and fought to protect themselves, their comrades, and the ships below. The ships increased speed, adopted evasive measures, and watched the swirling planes come closer to them. Besides the dive bombers, planes in a dogfight had the tendency to drift lower throughout a contest. When it was over, the Germans lost nine aircraft and the RAF at least two. As the raiders left, the ships were counted, and four had been sunk, with seven others damaged. Bad as this was, it could have been worse. The ships had their own balloon barrage, so no attack could come in low and right over a ship. But, on the other hand, it's suspected that the balloons helped the raiders pinpoint their location. Yes, a mistake had been made, but there was nothing for it now. In what was probably a feint to distract fighter command, right before noon, a raid coming from the Lu Duque area of at least 20 aircraft approached Dover. Fighter command, or rather 11 group, was pressed hard, but still adequately staffed, thanks to doubting, to meet this challenge. However, the raiders suddenly turned west and seemed to be heading for the limping convoy. But around Beachy Head, turned southeast and headed home. But it was then intercepted by three squadrons that had been trying to catch up to it, and two more German planes went down. However, the British lost five. Gehring's objective would be met one way or another. The Luftwaffe was probably thinking that their Dover feint would pull away the limited available aircraft in that area, and so launched two raids from Cherbourg to finish off the convoy. There were at least 100 aircraft in this latest attack, and looked on the RDF screens to be spread out along a 20-mile front. However, Fighter Command had more planes to draw on and sent six squadrons to intercept. Still, numbers tell, and the British were unable to stop the bombers from getting to the ships below. Squadrons 145, 257, 609, and 238 were able to take out about 20 German planes while losing about five of their own. But the Stukas got through. As a few more ships disappeared below the waves, the convoy, in panic, split up, which decreased the effectiveness of their balloon barrage, but probably saved a few more of them. The next large attack came about half past four that day. As the ships were reassembling, on came Luftlot 3 for another strike. This raid was supposed to finish off the convoy and damn near succeeded. Through the lessening clouds came 87 Stukas with 68 ME-110s and 109s. Group 10 was now involved and kept a fighter presence high over the ships. As the Germans came on, 43 and 145 squadrons lifted off to get enough height as to engage the oncoming raiders. Luckily for fighter command, 43 and 145 did achieve the height they needed and flew straight at the raiders. They soon got help from some of the patrol aircraft overhead and together they took out another 15 or so German aircraft. However, they lost six in doing so. Still, more ships were lost. In fact, by the time Peewit reached Swanage, of the 20 merchantmen, four were unharmed. Six were damaged to the point of having to make for closer harbors for repairs. At least seven were on the channel floor, and the rest has sustained different degrees of damage. 
Of course, the Luftwaffe wasn't going to let the pressure off of the RAF. That was the whole point. Around 3 p.m., two small raids approached over, but were successfully chased away. To the east, a Junkers 88 was reported near Cromer, but no raid appeared to take place. Still, Prudence demanded a fighter be sent to investigate, so more time and fuel were used up. Ironically, the ME-110s did relatively well. Normally, they were the weak link compared to the 109s. Also ironically, their tactic of going into a defensive circle when attacked helped more than usual. Their armor protected them better, and they tightened up for a collective defense. However, it had been a bloody day on both sides, including the ships below. But the RAF gave worse than it got, and in the end, that was their bitter recipe for survival. Park and others sent out congratulatory messages and hoped some of the five missing pilots would turn up. But as it would be the case for the next few months, none did. Losses for the day were 19 for the RAF and 31 for the Luftwaffe. Total reported losses to date were 92 and 184, respectively. The RAF order of the day had been, The Battle of Britain is about to begin. Members of the Royal Air Force, the fate of generations lies in your hands. They heeded these words on this day. And as for the German pilots, they were proud men who cared for their comrades and country and would be ready to go again the next day. Bombing that night was light but widespread, and it's easy to see why the Germans backed off after the day's events. It also begs the question, why not conduct massive bombing raids at night? The pilots would be safer from engagement, but with increased sorties, you increase your chances of collisions and accidents. Besides, the Luftwaffe saw itself as the master of the air, so such extreme tactics were not needed or worth the risk. Along with the night raids, mines were laid along the east, the southeast, the west, and south coasts. Beyond the coastlines, at 1.14 a.m., U-boat 37 sank the British merchant vessel Upway Grange, which was carrying 5,380 tons of frozen beef from Argentina. The ship went down 200 miles west of Ireland. Quickly, the crew and passengers loaded themselves onto the lifeboats. After the ship went down, the lifeboats came together, but one was missing. This loss, combined with losses from the initial attack, meant a total of 33 crew and three passengers were never seen again. The survivors, 42 crew and eight passengers, would not be picked up until three days later by the British trawler Narninwa, 50 miles from the Irish coast. And the Vitter, still hunting, found the Dutch collier Oostplein which was carrying 5,858 tons of coal from Britain to Buenos Aires. But this time, the entire crew of 34 were rescued by the German captain. Meanwhile, in the Mediterranean, Operation Tube continued as another submarine, HMS Proteus, reached Malta from Gibraltar, with more spare parts for the invaluable hurricanes. In British Somaliland, the British forces were trapped along the coast, near Berbera. General Archibald Wavell, the British commander-in-chief, Middle East Command, who was based in Cairo, sent regular British troops, the 2nd Battalion of the Black Watch, Royal Highlanders, as reinforcements. But it would be too little too late as the Italians started to shell Berbera. The weather was no better Friday, August 9th, with clouds and showers over most of Britain, and the channel having the same, minus the rain. What Fighter Command could not have known was that yesterday's intense action was not a planned operation, but merely a stumbled-upon enticing target. The Luftwaffe had in mind the same tactics for this day, but would not find such a tempting objective. Reconnaissance flights were sent out, and the action started on the east coast, as raids were up early in the morning, looking for ships. As the raiders approached the Norfolk coast, 
two squadrons were sent up in response, but the invaders turned away and headed home. Further up the east coast, near Sunderland, an HE-111 crossed the shore at 11.40 a.m. 79 squadron made up of hurricanes was sent up. The HE-111 was shot down soon after. But to keep fighter command off balance, and hopefully from quick responses like the one just mentioned that cost the Luftwaffe and HE, intensive reconnaissance and potential raids were carried out to the southwest throughout the afternoon. Back on the east coast, a reconnaissance flight spotted a convoy of Spurnhead. It was too far away for a successful raid to be escorted by 109s, so the pilot reported the location and suggested that submarines engage the ships later on in a more favorable location. And finally, the last major events of this light day were at Dover. Six raids approached the harbor and waged war on the balloon barrage. Around 100 of them were destroyed. The first two encounters were around 4.50 p.m., with four more raids a little later. Finders rose to intercept, but were unable to find the Messerschmitts through the clouds. Although the day's activities were relatively light, there were still casualties on both sides, although some of them were not known of right away. The RAF lost three aircraft and the Luftwaffe five. Total reported losses to date were 95 and 189, respectively. Garing had wanted his fighters and bombers to start Phase 2 and target airfields, control centers, and radar towers. But on the 8th, their focus was on the discovered convoy, and today the weather would not permit it. But now that it was dark, he could start. Of course, the accuracy would be off, but overall, his men would be safer. Activity was therefore increased this night compared to previous nights. Around 9 p.m., a raid flew over Kent and several more over Chatham. About the same time, six raids approached the coast between Plymouth and Portsmouth. Bombing was indiscriminate. There was mine laying off the Thames Estuary and on up to Harwich. At least seven additional raids later on crossed over the eastern coast between the Tyne and the Wash. Once inland, they turned in a northwesterly direction and continued with their raiding and bombing. Shortly after midnight, about a dozen raids, guessed to be more mine lane, were plotted between Aberdeen and the Wash. If Phase 2 could be successful, and the East Coast could be closed to the convoys due to the mining, it was felt that Britain would come, however reluctantly, to the negotiating table. About an hour later, near 1 a.m., Raids were very active near Hartlepool on the east coast, as a convoy was spotted nearby. Some bombs were used on the ships below, and the rest were for the airfields more inland. Gehring would start Phase 2, despite any odds. Back on the southern coast, Rookley on the Isle of Wight was hit with high explosive bombs. It's believed that Billingham Manor, which was used as a military headquarters, was the target. Several bombs were also dropped suspiciously near airfields along the south coast. And of course, the German U-boats still focused on cutting off needed supplies to the British homeland. At 8.32 that night, 70 miles west of Ireland, U-boat 30 sank the Swedish merchant vessel Canton, carrying 7,900 tons of iron, cloth, and other cargo from India and South Africa, to Britain. Sixteen members of its crew died, and the other sixteen survived. I guess it was up to fortune, fate, luck, joss, or simply chance to decide on which side these men ended up. On Saturday, August 10th, the weather, with its squalls, thunder, and gusts of wind, forced Gehring to postpone Adlertog, for 24 hours. He was unhappy about this, but still confident. So, as can be imagined, activity was light with reconnaissance flights and raiders seeking ships, but were unable to penetrate the clouds. 
The RDF stations plotted raids all over the entire lower half of the island, but actual contact was minimized by the clouds. The one serious opportunity came that afternoon to the east, when a Spitfire came upon a Dornier that was searching for trawlers or a convoy. The Spitfire caught up to the bandit from behind and emptied its entire ammunition at the Dornier, but the bomber then mockingly turned south and headed home. The one chance was gone for either side to inflict a casualty this day. So the total reported losses to date were unchanged, 95 and 189. That night had the normal mine lane and bombing raids, but the intensity was picked up. The first two hours past midnight saw 31 high-explosive bombs dropped on Northumberland. And right before 2 a.m., 12 high-explosive bombs were dropped on the Skinning Grove Iron and Steel Works. There were casualties among its workers, but its output was mostly unaffected. About 30 minutes later, at Color Coats, halfway between Hull and Edinburgh on the East Coast, three more high-explosive bombs fell, and there were again casualties. However, one of the bombs failed to detonate, so more casualties followed as the locals dealt with the cratered bomb. These were added to the ten deaths from that morning when airfields were bombed and repair crews were caught out in the open. There would be eight more raids along the east coast from North Foreland to Orfordness. The west coast was raided as well, with bombs being dropped and mine laying over the Bristol Channel. In fact, the raids would end for the night in the west. As dawn rose on the 11th, bombs were dropped on the Landor Viaduct near Swansea. Damage was extensive, and the railway would be shut down for at least three days. The people below were awakened to start another day, that is, except for the 17 killed that night, and at least eight more were injured. On the seas, British transport vessels and their crews continued to suffer. About 300 miles southwest of the Azores, the German armed merchant cruiser Vitter stopped the British-owned Finnish vessel Killerin. The ship was carrying 2,500 tons of maize and 500 tons of sugar from Buenos Aires to Las Palmas. But surprisingly, the crew of the Vitter was against sinking the old sailing ship built in 1900. But the Vitter surgeon was making a Nazi propaganda film and needed a big finish. So the Killerin's crew of 18 was taken off, and the Vitter blew up the ship with sail set. The surgeon got his finale. Off the north coast of Scotland, the Dutch merchant vessel Abula and the American steamer Crescent City collided. They and others were part of the convoy OA-196 and may have panicked at supposed German U-boats. The Abula sank, but before it did, the entire crew was transferred to the British destroyer HMS Jaguar. And to end this sad tale of British shipping for the night, around 1 a.m., the British armed merchant cruiser HMS Transylvania was struck with U-boat 56 Last Torpedo, about 20 miles north of Ireland. Amazingly, the ship did not sink, but 36 members of its crew were killed. Soon after, the destroyer HMS Ashanti and numerous trawlers rescued the 300 survivors. The Transylvania was taken in tow, but the damage was too great and sank a little later. There was another war being waged between powerful forces back in Germany, but this conflict was three-sided. We already discussed the issues behind the Army's demands for a successful invasion versus the Navy's ability to meet those demands. So this battlefield was the top of Hitler's desk, and the ammunition was limited to the reports flying across it. Now, the Navy had to call Goering on trying to win the battle on his own, rather than meeting the conditions of the Navy and therefore the Army. Yet they knew he was a power of his own, not to mention Hitler's darling. But they needed the right people to know that unless their conditions were met, there would be no invasion, and the German Admiralty was determined not to be placed with the blame. 
The first step was to record in the naval staff's diary that the Luftwaffe was waging total war and not attempting to win mastery of the air. And for his part, Gary made it clear to those it was safe to that he did not think much of sea line, and if he simply destroyed the RAF, the British would have no choice but to negotiate. This battle of paper shuffling was just beginning. Hey everyone, Ray here. So, I'm sure you've seen the headlines. Inflation is up, everything is more expensive, and it's probably not going to get any better anytime soon. Which tells us all, it's time to get our financial house in order. And that's where Upstart comes in. Upstart-powered personal loans can help you pay down high-interest debt, all online, with simple and easy-to-understand payment terms. So, whether it's paying off credit cards or consolidating high-interest debt, Upstart can help you get one fixed monthly payment with a clear payoff date. And this isn't your grandfather's loan process. Upstart considers more than just your credit score. You are more than that, and Upstart knows this. There's your employment history and income. All that is considered, too. And you can check your rate in minutes for loans between $1,000 and $50,000 without impacting your credit score. You can even receive funds as fast as one business day after accepting your loan. Don't wait and check your rate today at upstart.com slash World War II. That's upstart.com slash World War II to check your rate today. Don't forget to use our URL to let them know we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. Go to upstart.com slash World War II. By the end of that day, August 10th, the weather had not improved enough to Garing's satisfaction. So he postponed Adlertag until 5 a.m. on the 13th. Ironically, Sunday, August 11th, was a reasonably clear day and could have been used. But these things take time. However, Kesselring, not one to waste a day, especially with the impatient Garing only an angry phone call away, decided to try to draw out the RAF. Using ME-110s and 109s, Kesselring had four successful raids launched at the Dover area, starting at 7.30 that morning. Their goal was to take out as many barrage balloons as possible. Surely this would get their attention. And it did. In fact, Air Vice Marshal Keith Park of Eleven Group decided this was what they had been waiting for, the prelude to the main battle. The squadrons in nearby sections were activated and ran right into German fighter sweeps as planned. But when large formations of bombers did not follow, Park realized the bluff and recalled his planes. He refused to give the Germans any more of what they wanted, access to his fighters. Kesselring was hoping his feint wouldn't have been figured out so soon. Still trying, he had the raids over Dover last until noon, but Park now had his number. In a way, the Dover raid was more than just an attempt to get RAF fighters in the air. The thinking was that the RAF could have only so many fighters to the south, and that morning's excursions surely exhausted their pilots already. So, around 9.45 a.m., that NOR radar on the Isle of Wight detected a large buildup near Cherbourg. Eventually, this raid, made up of 54 Junkers and 20 Heinkels, started out for the Portland Naval Base. But, just ahead of them, were 61 ME-110s and 30 ME-109s. This raid, of at least 165 aircraft, was the largest so far. They were plotted as they left the area over northern France at 10 a.m., and in response, five squadrons of 42 fighters were initially sent up. But considering the number of bandits, 32 Hurricanes from 11 Group were also activated. A total of eight squadrons, 74 fighters, were on their way. The German fighters got there first and took up station, circling about 20 to 25,000 feet, five miles southeast of Portland. The first RAF fighters on the scene went after the ME-110s, judged to be the easier prey. 
A massive, confused dogfight ensued, with crisscrossing vapor trails filling the sky. The German bomber soon arrived, and as planned, tried to slip in under this chaos and go for the base. However, some of the late arriving hurricanes came roughly the same time and went after the bombers. Always fighter command's true focus. The bombers that could got through and successfully dropped their loads. Now they had to figure a way out. Fortunately for the Luftwaffe, as they were breaking away, more 109s showed up to cover the raid's exit. The British fighters were forced to stay in the area and deal with the new arrivals. As the last of the covering raid left, the RAF counted up their losses. There were 16 fighters missing, most of them to 109s. It had become a standard tactic to use the slower German fighters, the 110s, as bait. The RAF fighters would go after this weak link, only to soon find an ME-109 on their tail. They would come from sunward, if possible, and inflict serious damage even before the British pilot knew what was happening. Further counting found at least seven more British fighters seriously damaged, but able to make it home. And, considering the impending invasion, two destroyers, HMS Skate and Scimitar, were slightly damaged. But the Luftwaffe had suffered just as bad. They lost 18 aircraft, five bombers, seven 109s, and six 110s. The Raiders also lost two HE-59s, used to gather German pilots floating in the channel. A further five ME-110s and another bomber would need repair. As both sides left the scene, the Portland oil storage tanks below glowed red with fire. But that was just the immediate result of the German bombing. Rail services to Weymouth were totally blocked. Telephone lines were down, two breweries suffered greatly, and at least 17 homes were destroyed, with another 150 damaged. At least one civilian was killed, with 22 more injured. During all this, Churchill was launching with Air Marshal Bowhill, Dowling's opposite, a coastal command. Churchill had someone get fighter command on the line and find out the results. The news inspired the Prime Minister, who then went to a rifle range and practiced with a revolver, his cigar still between his teeth. While shooting off rounds, he talked about the best way to kill a Hun. But Downing, at Fighter Command, was thinking, with so many ME-110s opposing them, their kill score should have been higher. But what he didn't know was that Park's instructions from July 20th were not followed by 10 Group. Park wanted the higher German escorts engaged, and then all remaining fighters to fly right at the bomber formations, guns blazing. This almost always split up the formations, opening them to further attack, as well as reducing their effectiveness. But everyone in the RAF would learn in time, but those on the ground had to suffer until they did. With the previously mentioned aircraft production on both sides, the planes could be replaced, but the 14 British and 14 German pilots could not, not easily or quickly. Also, Two of the German losses were group commanders. Kesselring and Sperla could hardly afford this rate of loss. But the day was not done. A convoy of Harwich on the east coast, codenamed Booty, was spotted and went after by 110s to be followed by Dorniers. It was felt by the Luftwaffe commanders that the range was too far for the 109s. The raid consisted of at least 30 planes and the 110s got there first. The ships were harassed, the destroyer HMS Esk was slightly damaged, but soon fighters from 17, 74, and 85 squadrons showed up and tore into the raiders. When it was over, another four 110s were downed, along with three Dorniers. Six more of their numbers suffered damage. As for the RAF, the 110s, the supposed weak cousin of the 109s, fared well and took out another three British fighters and three more were damaged. Still, the Luftlots were not done. Another convoy near the Thames estuary had been spotted, and a raid was sent over as the one at Harridge wound down. About 45 Dorniers, a few Stukas, both escorted by 109s, made their way to the Thames. 
but 74th Squadron rose to challenge them. The fighting was intense, and in fact, two more squadrons, 54 and 111, were soon sent up to assist. But the worsening weather made organized attacks hard on the newly arrived squadrons. Only two 109s went down, and everyone from 74th Squadron made it home. However, 111 Squadron lost four hurricanes and their pilots. Another hurricane crash-landed, but that pilot survived. On a side note, the destroyer HMS Windsor in the Thames Estuary during the attack was damaged and would be out of action until the end of October. The deteriorating weather grounded most other planned sorties and that afternoon saw a few reconnaissance flights and potential raids along the southern coast. However, the raiders either turned away without attacking or returned home when it became clear that they would not be challenged further that day. Losses for the day were 27 for the RAF and 36 for the Luftwaffe. Total recorded losses to date were 122 and 225, respectively. Now that Adler Tog was close, the pressure had to be kept on the British coastline, shipping, and the people. It was still considered possible that a peace could be forced from the island. To some in the German hierarchy, sea line was still a last resort. Just after dark, numerous raids approached the south and southeast, as well as the west. Many bombs were dropped, with the corresponding damage to facilities, homes, and civilian casualties. At least 70 bombs were dropped, but about 21 of them did not explode on impact. In some ways, this caused more suffering, as people tried to dismantle the bombs, and the locals were forced to move away from the area, bringing life to a halt. Roughly the same ratio of unexploded bombs happened the night before. To the west, several railway signal boxes and their instruments were destroyed. This was followed up around 11 p.m. by extensive mine laying between Flamborough Head and the Farne Islands on the east coast. The rest of the night was spent by the Luftwaffe reminding the British people along the coast that yes, they were still there. And while the German bombers were harassing the British east coast, the U-boats stayed vigilant. At 3.10 p.m. that day, U-boat 38 sank the British steamer Landfair, about 125 miles west of Ireland. It had been carrying 7,800 tons of sugar, but now the cargo, along with three of its crew, were on the sea floor. The 30 survivors were later picked up by the American merchant vessel, California. Meanwhile, in North Africa, Major General Reed Goodwin Austin arrived in Berbera to take over the defense of British Somaliland. The now crowded British defenders were dug in at Tug Argan on six hills that overlooked the Hagersia Berbera Road. This was the route the Italians would have to use to take the capital. The Italians came on with their attack. Three of the hills were quickly pressed, but the invaders only captured one by the end of the day. Back in London, General Wavell, the commander-in-chief, Middle East, had a conversation with Churchill, and then Churchill and the war cabinet made a decision that would affect the war in North Africa. It was obvious that if British Somaliland fell, Egypt would be their next target. So, despite Britain's woeful lack of heavy arms, it was decided to send 150 tanks, about half of the total number in Britain, 48 anti-tank guns, and another 48 field guns, along with 20 Beaufort anti-aircraft guns, to Egypt. The Suez Canal had to be protected at all costs. Monday, August 12th, was a fine day as far as the weather went, with a few misty patches in the channel, but it was more than good enough for the Luftwaffe on this Adler Tog Eve. Both groups of fighter pilots had sky-high morale, pardon the pun, and as for the Germans, it might have been even higher if they knew that fighter command had standing orders for their fighters to focus only on the German bombers. Those pilots were nervous enough already. The statistics for them were already not good. More than one bomber pilot was known to be able to only hold down black coffee and English cigarettes. As for the British pilots, it was crystal clear. They had nothing to lose and everything to gain. 
Since July, the drinks in the pubs around airfields had been getting stronger to help the men deal with the sorties and the pain of losing friends. Still, they found that breathing in oxygen from their masks and a rush of fear as they climbed into their cockpits sobered them right up. The Luftflotte commanders had come to realize that those towers along the British coast were more than radio transmitters, and so had to be taken out if the upcoming Day of Eagles was going to be as successful and as short as predicted. The job of taking out the towers on the southern coast went to the one special unit created for the battle against Britain. Erprobungsgruppe 210, or Operational Trials Wing 210, were made up of planes that combined attributes of the ME-109 and ME-110. They were fighter bombers, but specialized. Willie Messerschmitt made them to deliver a small weight of bombs, very accurately, onto small targets from low altitudes while in a shallow dive. With their loads gone, they were then to act like fighters. They were designated ME-210, hence the unit's name, and will be referred to as ME-210s from now on. They were led by Special Training Officer Hauptmann Walter Rubensdorfer, and they had an important objective this day. These 20 or so planes took off for Dover about 8.40 a.m. in four groups. As they approached, the radar station at Rye picked them up and, by their speed, were thought to be fighters. But the plotters were uncertain about this, and so designated them with an X, which meant unidentified. But to add to the confusion, before they reached the coast, they split into four staffel, or groups. One kept heading toward Dover, and soon enjoyed watching the radar masts sway and then fall, as their approach was perfect, their bombs accurate, and no fighters challenged them. Another group had even better luck at the radar station at Pevensey, further southwest along the coast from Dover. One plane hit the tower eight times, which took out the station's electricity and took Rye completely off the air. Another group went more inland and dropped its entire load on Dunkirk in Kent. Dunkirk is located north of the other two stations, about halfway between them. Somehow, they then all made it back to Calais, without seeing a single British fighter. The plan worked brilliantly. The chain home or radar stations at Dover, Pevensey, and Rye were inoperable. A hole now existed from East Kent to West Sussex in the southeast. The other nearby radar stations would have to make up for them in warning fighter command. This was especially true for the Ventnor station on the Isle of Wight. And because of its location on the southern coast of the island, Fighter Command felt comfortable that the slack would be picked up. They also knew that repairs would be handled quickly on the damaged stations, and in fact, most were up and running by the end of the day. To test the effects of their daring morning raid, two more formations headed towards the Thames, joined up, totaling just over 25 aircraft, and attacked convoys in the Channel and the Thames Estuary. Damage came fast, and two minesweeping trawlers were sunk. The HMT Pyro, six of its crew died, and the HMT Tamarisk, seven of its crew, were killed. There indeed seemed to be a lag in Fighter Command's normal response times, but fighters were activated, and not all the bandits made it home. Now, it was time for the next part of the day's plan. A large force of 200-plus bombers and fighters, about 150 ME-109s and 110s, the rest bombers, headed for the weak link in Fighter Command's chain of radar stations. In fact, the first station to pick them up was a chain home low station that was meant to focus on shipping or low-flying aircraft. Plotting was difficult, if only because the ladies in the control room had no experience with formations of this size. But members of the Observer Corps confirmed a large formation was on its way to the coast. It was a few minutes before noon. It was now clear to Fighter Command that the massive raid was heading for Portsmouth, just above the Isle of Wight. Fifty-eight fighters were scrambled to intercept it, but then, around Selsey Bill, the raiders split into two groups. The larger of the two continued on towards Portsmouth. The other group turned south. First, 
The 109s and 110s took up a position high over the port city. Then, most of the bombers braved the balloon barrage and AA fire to drop their payloads on the dockyards and town. The much smaller group of bombers flew over the Isle of Wight and, once in its center, dropped lower into a shallow dive. Their only resistance were three Beaufort guns. The conditions were perfect for the bombers, just like many of their practice runs, and their results were equally routine. Seventy-four bombs were dropped around the Ventnor station with fifteen direct hits. Ventnor was down and would remain so for many days. It was then that the 58 British fighters came on the scene. In what can only be described as an extremely unusual tactic, the German fighters above, knowing their best chance for kills, came on their first dive, waited 15 minutes for the right moment. In an air battle with planes that can reach speeds up to 400 miles an hour, 15 minutes is an eternity. At least, it felt that way to the abandoned bombers below. The Portsmouth AA guns helped out, but the British fighters were able to wreak havoc among the German bombers before their fighter escorts came swooping down. At least 11 bombers were taken out of the sky. And when the battle was finally joined by both groups of fighters, 10 more German aircraft were lost. The 110s got the worst of it, but 10 British aircraft suffered the same fate. Kesselring was excited by the day's events, and even more enthusiastic when he was told that his ME-210s were ready for another sortie, but this time they would be reinforced with 18 Dorniers. Now their total number was about 50 aircraft. Their target was the Manston Airfield. Part of Kesselring's delight was the coming of Phase 2. He was eager for it as well. Taking out convoys certainly affected their British enemies, but ravaging the support system of the RAF would yield greater results. It was the only way to truly dominate the air over southern Britain. The ME-210s with their Dornier additions took off and were over the Manston airfield by 1250. Normally, the only planes to take off from this airfield were nighttime fighter plemons of 600 Squadron. As the British had painfully found out, these fighters were no longer in the top class of aircraft and were better used in the darkness. But today was not a normal day for Manston. Sometimes different squadrons spent time there using it as a forward base, and today 65 Squadron was stationed there. 65 Squadron had already flown one sortie today and had landed, rearmed, and refueled by the time of this attack and all but one of their Spitfires took off to engage the bandits. The fighting was fierce and fast. 54 Squadron rose to assist and managed a few kills. But as the dogfight moved away from the airfield, the Dorniers came in and dropped about 150 bombs. Two hangars, some workshops, and the airfield itself was damaged. The field would be mostly repaired by night, but the buildings would take longer. There were four deaths and eight more people wounded on the ground. The ME-210s then quickly headed for home to ready themselves for another raid. As they were preparing, other bombers were striking the Lim airfield. On the Kent coast, it was used as an emergency landing ground. It had already been hit once that morning. Soon, the ME-210s were once again in the air and headed for their next target, Hawkinge a satellite airfield near Folkestone. They got by the British bombers and destroyed a hangar, damaged another, flattened several stores and two houses in the airmen's married quarters. They also left 28 craters in the airfield. Six airmen were wounded and two Spitfires were damaged. They contentedly pulled away right before 6 p.m. German pilots reported as they came back of the numerous British aircraft they shot down or bombed on the airfields. But Kessel Ring needed to be sure. Small raids were sent out over Kent and bombed coastal towns. Sure enough, Fighter Command responded and inflicted more damaging losses on the Luftwaffe. Fighter Command was still actively defending the coasts. Still, Kessel Ring would take the day's tally. Manston was totally destroyed, 
Hawk Inge and Lim unusable, 46 Spitfires and 23 Hurricanes destroyed, and that compared to the Germans losing about half that number. Or rather, that was what the German pilots reported back to their superiors. But in reality, it was a different story. The RAF lost 22 aircraft to the Luftwaffe's 31. The targeted airfields were operational by the next morning, some of them on the same day. The worst of it was the Ventner radar station, and parts of that were operational within three days. Total reported losses to date were 144 and 256, respectively. And looking at the day's events with 2012 eyes, when Dowding praised the WAFs for remaining calm during the bombardment, the female listeners may react with something along the lines of, well, what did you think was going to happen? Amazingly, with the numbers of aircraft used on this day, the attempt to remove the advantage of radar was only half-heartedly undertaken. This was because men like Kesselring's chief of staff, Oberst Paul Dykman, who didn't care about radar because they wanted the British to know they were coming, and he was not alone. The thinking went, this way the vaunted 109s could get a chance at every British fighter that would be sent up when the large German bomber formations were coming at them. However, the bomber pilots generally did not subscribe to this theory. Indeed, this aggressive attitude was shared by many fighter pilots, which partially explained the delay in the German fighter planes before they dove down to attack the British fighters, who were busy increasing their scores at the expense of the German bombers. And, without knowing it, Air Vice Marshal Park was beginning to drive a wedge in between the two groups of pilots. The Luftwaffe could either allow the RAF access to their bombers, significantly reducing their effectiveness and numbers, or stay close to the bombers and assist them in getting through to their targets. The first idea fitted the egos of the German fighters, who all wanted to be aces, and the second fitted with the thinking of the German Navy and Army, who needed certain conditions met to move forward with the invasion. Strategically, the Luftwaffe had the initiative, but tactically, the RAF did. That night saw mine laying practically everywhere, to the northeast, the east coast, to the south, and over the Bristol Channel. But the numbers were intensified. Also, the bombing that took place showed a massive increase as well as airfields were targeted. For example, the Canterbury area in the southeast was hit with more than 200 high-explosive bombs. The Thames estuary got special attention as well. But as impressive as this showing was, the night went to the British Bomber Command, or rather, just one of their pilots, Flight Lieutenant Roderick Learoyd. As the sun went down, their target for the night was the aqueduct on the Dortmund-Ems Canal, and as a main artery of Germany's inland waterway, it was being used to help move barges to the invasion points for sea line. If it could be demolished or blocked up, then valuable time, the other enemy of Germany, besides the weather and radar, would be lost. So five Hamptons from 49 and 83 squadrons would attempt the dangerous low-level attack. The mission had to succeed, so the bombers would take turns going in, instead of risking all being shot down at once. The first two started the run, but were quickly shot down. The next two went in, but again quickly were found and hit, suffering enough damage to demand that they pull out or end up like the first two. That left Leroy and his Hampton. He started down, somehow making it through the flak and searchlights, and dropped his load. He just missed his target, but when working with bombs, you only have to get so close. He then pulled out and managed to get his now-damaged aircraft back home. For this, Learoyd was awarded the Victoria Cross. The canal would be unusable for 10 days, which muddled the timetable for the invasion. Hey everyone, Ray here. I've never told you this before, but I live in a cove. It's very nice, but everyone around me is retired, and they spend hours every day on their lawn, which always leaves my yard bringing up the rear. But now I have a ringer. 
that being Sunday Lawn Care. This year will be different. Yes, spring is here and it's time to get the lawn ready and keep it looking great. Again, I'll be leaning on Sunday to help me. And if you should give them a try, like me, you'll not have to worry about chemicals. Your lawn will look great and your family will be safe. Because Sunday can help you grow a beautiful lawn without the guesswork or the nasty chemicals. Here's how it works. When I signed up for Sunday, their lawn analysis tools created a personal nutrient plan delivered right to my door when I need it. They send the packages, I attach them to my garden hose, and spray. I'm done in less than 15 minutes. No more hard work. Instead, I'm working smarter. And you can too. And Sunday is offering our listeners 20% off. Full season plans start at just $129 and you get 20% off at checkout when you visit GetSunday.com slash World War II. That's 20% off your custom plan at GetSunday.com slash World War II. Out in the Atlantic, near the Azores, the Italian submarine Malaspina sank the British tanker British fame using five torpedoes. But incredibly, the Italian ship risked itself by staying on the surface for another day to tow the survivors and lifeboats to safety. Meanwhile, in East Africa, the Italians attacked the British defensive perimeter at Tug Argon. They managed to wrestle another hill from the defenders and captured two of the British's four 3.7-inch howitzers. The Italians now controlled the south side of the Hargesia Barbera Road. The weather on the night of the 12th seemed fine enough to promise another usable day. The meteorological predictions reinforced this, but as weather reconnaissance flights were sent up before dawn on Tuesday, August 13th, they reported developing clouds in the channel with scattered drizzle. Gehring was still focused on his three-day plan, so postponed Adler talk again. But he was running out of time and patience, so the postponement was only until that afternoon. Adler talk had to be a massive, well-organized, overwhelming body blow to the enemy. But then came a breakdown in communications, which is nothing new in combat. But because of Adler talk, it had a singular significance. It started with Oberst Lieutenant Johannes Fink, who was chosen to lead the first mission of the day that would deliver a crippling blow to the enemy. Fink had many responsibilities, but today, as Geschwalder commander of KG-2, or Kampf Geschwalder II, Battle Wing II, he relished his position. By 5 a.m., his Dorniers were in the air and linking up with their escorts over the channel. The escorts were ME-110s, led by the one-legged World War I veteran, Oberst Lieutenant Joachim Huth, as they were meeting up, the staff of Luftflot 2 headquarters was signaling everyone about the postponement. Despite the normal German thoroughness, the order did not get through to Fink's second and third group, of which he was a part. But Huth got the message and wondered why Fink and his planes were still heading over the channel. Desperate and not knowing that Fink's radio was set to a different frequency, Huth flew his fighter in Fink's path and turned home, hoping he would be followed. But Fink assumed he was showing off and continued on. Pilots are pilots, after all. Huth took his fighters and headed for home. One wonders why Fink continued without escorts, especially since there was a standing order for bombers to abandon any mission without fighter escort. But soon Fink was joined by other fighters. They were from the 210 group who hadn't received the cancellation order either. Together, they continued on to Fink's objectives, Sheerness and the airfield at East Church on the Isle of Sheppey. And since almost everyone else who would be attacking in the southeast got the cancellation, we would normally expect the day to end very quickly for Fink and his Dorniers. But Fighter Command had their own missed opportunities, and these dovetailed into Fink's mission very neatly. First off, the Dorniers and Fighters, 55 in all, 
were missed by the radar operators. Next, the observer corps spotted the bombers, but were way off in guessing their numbers and bearing. Five squadrons were activated, but only 74 squadron intercepted them right before their bomb run, and one Dornier was taken out. The clouds helped hide the bombers on their approach, and both targets were hit. East Church's airfield was cratered, and hangars and other buildings were destroyed. A few Blemons were damaged, and one Spitfire was wrecked. Ironically, that one Spitfire was a cheap price for what it bought Fighter Command. East Church belonged to Coastal Command, not Fighter Command. 266 Squadron had only been there since the 9th, and were using the field to help with convoy protection. But, their response helped to convince the Luftwaffe that it was a fighter base and thus was attacked seven more times by the first week of September. Coastal Command would not agree, of course, but Fighter Command was content to have East Church bombed repeatedly. Their fighters and pilots were safe from harm. On the bomber's way back home, 111 and 151 squadrons managed to run into them in between the clouds and attacked. Four more German aircraft were shot out of the sky. As the raiders landed, they confirmed that five were missing. Fink, who was upset by his losses, exploded when he found out about the cancellation. Still, he had good news to deliver. Ten Spitfires were destroyed on the ground, and East Church Airfield was devastated. But once more, these claimed victories were exuberantly inflated. Further west, the postponement order seemed to reach no one in Air Fleet 3 as a planned attack moved forward. By a quarter after five that morning, the three main sorties were in the air and heading towards their targets. To the airfield of the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough, some 20 JU-88s were on their way. To the Army Cooperation Airfield at close by ODM, about 18 Junkers 88s were en route. And lastly, towards Portland, 88 Junkers 87s were closing in. But in front of these bombers were 60 ME-110s and 173 ME-109s. This gives you an idea of why Gehring was so confident throughout July and early August. He had the material to bring fighter command to its knees, and therefore Britain to the table to talk. But the Emmys soon ran into the clouds and drizzle that postponed Adler Tog to begin with. When the bombers came along, they tried to find their targets, but most couldn't, and headed home. Still, some would try to complete their mission and pay the price for it. Any hole in the British radar was only imaginary, and Fighter Command knew what was coming. It caused them great concern, these numbers, but they knew what was coming. So fighters from Middle Wallop, Tangmir, and Northolt responded and searched through the clouds. The raiders were on their way home now, but some of the defenders found them, and soon four Junkers 88s and one 109 was sent into the channel. At least 11 more bombers had some level of damage. The surviving German aircraft landed and again reported claims that could not be supported by reality. The Emmys claimed six RAF fighters, and the bombers, not to be outdone, claimed 14 victories. But the truth was that the Emmys got one fighter and damaged another one. The bombers damaged five fighters, but all of them were able to land. However, two of them had to be written off. Three RAF pilots were injured, but would soon be back in the battle. Further west, there was just one more major snafu for the Luftwaffe on this day. Some 10 ME-110s headed for Portland and were joined by more fighters. But the bombers, who were also to join them, finally got the postponement notice and so didn't take off. The fighters decided not to miss out on an opportunity and decided on some happy hunting. It worked in that they got fighter command's attention, but it didn't work and that two squadrons of hurricanes rose up to meet them. The Germans lost more than they took. They ended up losing six more aircraft with a further two crash landing, while the RAF lost one 
and had two more damaged. What the Luftwaffe could not know was that a mobile radar set was operational to help fill the gap at Ventnor. As the morning went on, the weather slowly improved, and by 2 p.m. that afternoon, Adler Tog, the Day of Eagles, was officially launched. Cities, ports, and airfields would be attacked along the south coast and eastward to the Thames. The first massive raid was projected to start at 4 that afternoon. That way, the different squadrons could not assist each other as they would be too busy defending their own responsibilities. To the west, the raiders came on in roughly two formations, although they would soon break for their individual targets. One group consisted of 120 Junkers 88s, escorted by 30 ME 110s. The other was made up of 77 Junkers 87s, and protected by a slightly larger number of fighters than the first group. But, to have the best of both worlds, the bombers were closely protected by some fighters, while still other fighters were free to hunt for their British counterparts. So, in front of both of these formations was a group of 30 ME-109s. However, as soon as the leading fighters reached the coast below Dorset, they were intercepted by 609 Squadron and lost three of their number. The fickle weather had not improved over some of the inland targets, and so the bomber formations, after breaking up, couldn't find their targets. So they collectively decided to head for Portland. It was relatively easy to find and of importance. Some of the other bombers went for Southampton. With these numbers coming at them, 10 Group, responsible for the Southwest, had every fighter it had up in the air. And this time, Park's tactics were employed. So while some fighters kept the Emmys high overhead busy, other squadrons were free to engage the bombers. In one Staffel, or group, six of its nine planes were shot out of the sky. Southampton was hit hard, and heavy damage was inflicted on the docks and the city. However, the Spitfire factory at Woolston, on the east side, was undamaged. Fires spread before they can be contained, and places like Pickford's Depository and Raleigh's Cycle Works were gutted. Frustrated bombers also went after Portland, further west, but ran into 152, 213, and 601 squadrons, and were less successful than the raiders over Southampton. Poole was also hit, but again, the damage was nothing like Southampton. The lingering clouds helped and hurt the invaders and defenders. And of course, both sides suffered casualties, damaged planes, and wounded the other's pilots. However, the British were able to add to this list many civilian casualties and property damage. This massive attack that stretched for miles was balanced out by another attack to the southeast. Kesselring sent his 210 group up again to attack Southend, just above the Thames estuary. They lifted off at 3.15 p.m., but as they got close to Southend and Essex in general, the cloud cover was thick and widespread. It was decided to head for home, but soon their escorts were engaged by 56 Squadron. The bombers knew they needed all their speed to have any chance to make it back to France, so they dropped their loads over Canterbury and were now lighter and made for the clouds. Not wanting Fighter Command to be able to focus their southeastern squadrons on the raid just mentioned, Kessel Ring also sent the only two Stuka groups attached to Air Fleet 2. He wanted them to attack the airfields at Rockford and Detling. Again, that was Rockford and not Rochester, as has been reported. One of the groups was unable to find Rockford, again due to clouds, and so returned home without engaging the enemy. The other group made for the Coastal Command airfield at Detling and, flying blindly through the clouds, were amazed the air over the airfield was clear. The unchallenged raiders went into their dive, as they had done many times before, and released their bombs. The damage was significant. The station commander was killed, along with 67 others. Also, every hangar was destroyed, along with eight Blenheims. And within minutes, the bombers were hidden in the surrounding clouds.
However, one of the escorting 109s did not make the return flight home. By the end of the day, Fighter Command still had its confidence, but it was shaken. Their defense over the previous weeks was something to be proud of, but this was something different. Still, their radar worked, the fighters gave more than they got, but the number of sorties, deaths, damages, and planes to be written off had all increased. When Dowling said the defense could go on indefinitely, he meant on paper, in theory. The men flying the planes and those making sure the planes were ready to fly were already starting to show signs of extreme fatigue and stress. Still, they managed to take out 34 Luftwaffe planes while only losing 13 of their own. But could they keep that going? To give an example for comparison, for the last few weeks, the RAF had been flying about 700 sorties a day. On this opening day of Adler Tag, the Germans had flown 1,485 sorties. The British were in the final and playing at home, but they were well matched. Total losses to date were 157 and 290, respectively. That evening, darkness came and the night raids began. Again, it seemed as if the breadth and width of Britain was flown over and bombed. This was possible because most of the raids consisted of a single or very few bombers. Convoys were hunted for and mines were lame. Fighter Command sent up pursuers, but like usual, could find nothing in the darkness. The Luftwaffe's best sortie came at 11.10 p.m., as several bombs were dropped on the Nuffield Aeroplane Factory north of London. Damage was considerable, with about 30 casualties. But the real question was, to what degree was their production affected? They would have to wait and see. The naval battle came closer to home, as the minesweeping trawler HMT Elizabeth Angela was sunk by German bombing that night. One of Elizabeth's crew was killed. And further away from the channel, the Swedish steamer Nils Gorthen was attacked by U-Boat 60, 10 miles north of Ireland. It had been carrying pulp wood. There were five killed, but 16 of its crew survived. Meanwhile, the Battle of British Somaliland continued. But this time, the army gets help from the British Navy. As the troops hold on to their strip of land along the coast... The British cruiser HMS Carlisle shoots down an Italian aircraft that was attacking Berbera. Also, about 40 miles west of there, destroyer HMS Kimberley and the sloop HMS Auckland shell the port of El Shika, which was now in Italian hands. And still, the overwhelming Italian troops press on the British defenders at Tug Argen, but they are held off for another day. Next time, we watch Gehring launch more and more of his planes into the skies, and Britain's air shield will be pushed past its limit. The true test of doubting system will begin. Greetings, everyone from Central Virginia. Sorry this episode was so long, but I wanted to hurry up and get to Adler Talk just because we've been talking about it for months. So hopefully in the next podcast I'll be able to do um, another week or so and get the battle going. And then we can probably stop maybe near the end of September and start up in North Africa. We'll see how it goes. I just wanted to quickly thank some people for donations. I haven't done that in several episodes, and I'm really sorry. So here's a, a couple of names I just want to throw out to you. Uh, Robert and Elvira P., from Bray, California, and they've uh, donated before, so thank you guys. Um, Adam T. from London. Um, Bob G. from Bassingstoke, UK. I'm sure I butchered that. Malcolm C. from Charnwood, Australia. Kieran M. from Antrim, UK. Damien G. from Louisiana in the U.S. Patrick M. from Chicago in the U.S. Dennis B. from California. Paul F. from Buckinghamshire, UK, Jeff F. from Victoria, Australia, and Paul R. from Bedfordshire in the UK. 
So again, thank you very much. There's a lot of resource material out there, and your donations are helping me a lot. And finally, I'd like to thank Christelle W. in Australia for ordering all the CDs. I've never mailed anything to Australia before. So take care, everyone, and I will see you soon with episode 50.